everyone. Welcome to A Moment with God. And if you're listening to our podcast, it's K.N. George podcast. And so today we are so happy. Uh, we are continuing with that conversation that we've been having, you know, that thing about uh, heaven. And so I hope that, you know, you've been listening and, and actually watching as we have this conversation. Heaven is real. Heaven is a real place. Heaven is actually a place that is prepared for those who believe in Jesus Christ. While we are heaven, you know, God, we shall all meet God and we are all going to be a happy, big, happy family. But the thing is this, even as we have this happy family, there will be people who will be facing some challenges in heaven. Uh, and as I've covered in the past videos, you can go on and watch them so that you build up to this one. All right. So now, uh, what is heaven? Let's now get deeper into it so that we as a kuelewa what we are talking about. So if you look at the scriptures, they give us a wonderful perspective about heaven. So what you've noticed in the past is that I've been sharing um, some ideas I have about heaven. And, and I want you to join me in this idea. So we will start with a few verses here. Uh, where, what is heaven? Uh, to understand that first, because if we don't understand what is heaven, we may never really understand where we are going. The place where God most fully makes known his presence is what we call heaven. In other words, heaven is this place where the presence of God is full. Now, when I say that, I'm talking about uh, fully experiencing the presence of God. I'm not talking about uh, portions or moments where you experience God. And I know that if you're a believer in a Pentecostal, you have actually uh, experienced some moments. And even if you're not, you have experienced some moments with God. Those moments when you feel that you want to cry. The presence of God is so heavy and so much that you cannot contain it. You're unable to contain it. And I remember that time when King Saul, uh, not Saul, sorry, when King Solomon was dedicating the temple and, and the Bible says that he went in and prayed and God's presence was so much that the priests could not get into the temple. Uh, you see, God reveals himself, there, there are levels or there are ways that God can reveal himself to the point where you are unable to walk, unable to move, unable to stand, unable to do anything because there's too much of God or too much presence. And that is what actually happened at that time uh, when Solomon prayed. And the priest, the Bible says that the priests could not go in because God's presence filled the temple. Just think about that for a moment. You know, in, in other words, it means that there is a possibility that sometimes God can fill a certain place with his presence that it is impossible for any human being to walk into that place or to survive in that place because of his presence. My God. You see, I, I, do, I do worship sometimes, as a worship service and worship event. And we lift up our hands and we worship and, and we love it with songs and music and dancing and just great moment with God. And sometimes in these worship events, there's a lot of, uh, you know, God's presence actually comes upon, upon the people. And and we experience him. We feel him like he's present. But there has been no time. I, don't, I can't remember any time, not just in my meetings, but in the world. I can't remember any time when God's presence was so much that the people could not go into a church. Okay. In fact, in today's world where there is God's presence, you want to run there. Okay. And so... And I pray today that God will make his presence fully known on this earth so that we are able to also experience some form of revival, some form of awakening, some form of, uh, uh, you know, 
uh, motivation, especially to the sleeping Christians. And so heaven is that. You see, you see that moment when you have experienced God, uh, whether you are in a, in, a, in a meeting, an event, a convention, wherever you are, you are, and you experienced that presence, that tangible presence, whether you are that, just imagine experiencing that for the rest of your life without really walking away from it and not being able to walk away from it. You're experiencing it every day, every hour, every moment, every second. The presence of God. That is heaven. That is what heaven will be like. In fact, in Revelation 21, it says that the new heavens and the new earth, there shall be no sun because we shall not need the sun. The presence of God will light up that world. His presence. The throne of God will be so bright. And if you study about the city of Jerusalem that comes from heaven into the new earth, so it lands into the new earth, this city of Jerusalem. And this is the time we are doing that study of the city of Jerusalem. And we, are we were trying to see how uh, the measurements of the city, and we realized it is, the distance is like, it covers maybe Kenya and Sudan. Kenya and part of Ethiopia and part of Sudan is how big the city will be like. And then there are hundreds, maybe thousands or perhaps millions of rooms in that city. Okay, if you study um, uh, Revelation 21, you will have all these, uh, all these figures. So, heaven will be fun. Heaven will be amazing. Heaven will be great. Heaven will be the best place to be. I mean, heaven will be better than the, the shopping malls. It will be better than what you think is fun. Okay, so you look at that thing that you think is fun, multiply it times a thousand upon a thousand upon another thousand, a thousand, and you have uh, heaven. It's impossible for us to actually, um, uh, you know, imagine heaven. It's impossible. It doesn't matter how much you imagine. Imagine your best imagination about heaven is still zero. In heaven, we will be seeing um, colors that we don't see on this earth. For example, there are several places in the book of Revelation in Isaiah that talks about whiter than white, meaning what we call white on this earth, there is a, something that is whiter than white in heaven. When you talk about lapis lazuli, for example, the feet where the feet of God rest, and it's purplish and bluish in color, that's where the feet of God rest, you know. When you talk about that, and you think about it and you want to see it, my goodness, it's just, it blows your mind just to think about it. Now, the throne of God is kind of scary. It's a magnificent throne, but it's scary because on his feet there is thunder and fire and he's surrounded by a rainbow and upon him and around him is fire and thunder around this throne. So, it's not a throne that you want to go and, and, and begin to, to play around with. Okay, this is, a, this is a throne of the Almighty God in heaven. So let's look at the Bible, Isaiah 66 verse 1. Uh, let's just see what the Bible says about that throne that I'm talking about. You know, it's a throne that is in heaven, and it's a throne that is carried by the cherubim. But this is what he says. This is what the Lord says, heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool. Where is the house you built for me? Where will my resting place be? <laughs> hold on, hold on, hold on. All right, now, is it that God is trying to show how powerful and strong he is? No. I mean, like God already knows he's powerful, he's strong. He already knows that he is he is God. He doesn't have to, uh, to announce himself or to try and show how powerful he is. But he's just making a statement of for us to know. So imagine this. Imagine where heaven is. From this side of the world, 
I cannot see heaven. So many people say it's a spiritual place. But I don't believe heaven is spiritual. I believe heaven is as physical as this earth is. Okay? Now, and the reason I'm, I say this is because if it's a spiritual place, then what does that even look like? What does that mean when we talk about heaven being spiritual, yet we can see it? You can touch angels. Angels can touch you. You can talk to them. I mean, like, they can bless you. This is physical people. Okay, we are in this physical world and heaven is in another physical place but can be accessed by the spirit. The reason why I believe it's a spiritual place, uh, it's a physical place that can be accessed spiritually is because if you have been to heaven, it is so real. It is as real as the world you're living in. And so it's hard to believe and to think that it's a spiritual. The reason I'm against that is because when people say it's a spiritual place, it's as if they're like, uh, well, I don't, I don't really understand it, so let's just leave it to the spirit. Okay, But that's not the case. Heaven is real, and it's a real place. And, and God says, <clears throat> heaven is my throne, and the earth is my footstool. In other words, this is how big I am. I am seated in heaven, and my feet are on the earth. Okay? We don't know where heaven is. Like It has never been traced geographically and say, okay, this is heaven. For some reason, we always look up when we are saying, oh, heaven, oh, thank God for the heavens. And then when we are talking about the earth, we look down. Uh, the hell, uh, when we're talking about hell, oh, hell is down. I don't know who came up with that, but you know, if you remember, the earth is round, and so up can be any direction of the earth, and down is within the earth. So hell, I don't know where hell is. But God knows. Heaven, I don't know. I can't tell you geographically this is heaven. But it exists. Okay? And so God is saying, wherever heaven is, wherever we think it is, that is where he has his throne. And wherever we think the earth is in, you know, in proximity to heaven, that is where he has his foot. The earth is his footstool. In other words, he says, I rule from heaven. And this is the earth. So we have to understand that part. So he says, where is the house you will build for me? Like what kind of house can you build that can fit me or that I can fit in? Where will my resting place be? Okay. And, and because of this, we as human beings cannot build anything that God can fit into. So it doesn't matter how much money you spend on your cathedral, my friend. You can, spend, you can spend billions. And you see, like, I see pastors who raise a lot of money <clears throat> um, uh, to build churches and cathedrals. And I'm like, well, all the best, guys, all the best. But God cannot dwell in a cathedral. He cannot dwell in a church. He cannot dwell in a building. Uh, this is a question he asks. Where will my resting place be? So let's stop lying to people by telling them that we are building a house for God because God doesn't need a house. Let's stop lying to them when we say we are building an altar for God because God's altar is in heaven. Okay. Now, there are so many things I can talk about altars, but I don't want to talk about it right now. But did you know that in heaven there's an altar? I mean, go back to Isaiah 6 where... Uh, King Uzziah dies and Isaiah suddenly realizes, oh my God, I need to, you know, to serve God. Uh, because it seems like Uzziah was the, the roadblock. Now, I don't know how King Uzziah was a roadblock to Isaiah seeing God, but it's there. Maybe, maybe King Uzziah used to tell Isaiah to do things that were undignified or things that only kings can order you to do and you do so. When Uzziah died, Isaiah says, I saw the Lord. And, and that's an interesting statement, just as it is. But again, let's not dwell uh, into that. Now, Isaiah says, I saw the Lord. And, and the Lord asked, uh, so Isaiah sees himself in heaven. And the Lord is saying how evil the earth is. And he says, whom shall we send? So God is asking the angels. So Isaiah is able to see heaven. okay, And at the same time, He's in heaven, in the spirit, of course, but in a physical place called heaven. And so, 
and he is able to listen to conversations in heaven that are going on and 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 God is saying to to these people who are around him and, and maybe angels and all this and he's saying and they're saying whom shall we send who will go for us God says so wait a minute is it that God has failed to find a person who can go for him no is it that God has failed to do something about what you know he wants done no but there's something that we have to understand for god to operate on earth he needs a human being because in genesis he creates the human being and says i have given you dominion and power over the earth and god is not about to go back on his word in which he has given man dominion so he needs someone he can send and isaiah says here i am but i am a man of unclean lips okay so basically and clean lips comes to the play and we are all men and women of unclean lips it doesn't matter what you do what you've done uh, the kind of prayers you make we are all men and women of unclean lips and we are not different from Isaiah but watch what happens and one of the creatures known or let me not call creatures but known as a seraphim goes into the altar in heaven and takes out a coal and comes and touches Isaiah's lips and now their lips are clean there is an altar in heaven therefore god does not need an altar on earth it doesn't matter how fancy how nice how pumped up you're going to make your altar god does not dwell in human houses or things made by human and that's why jesus christ did not come to live in a place or to start a structure called a church but instead he came to dwell in our hearts because it's the only place that god finds rest is in our hearts the only place that god can fit on this earth is in our hearts and that's the difference between religion between christianity and other religious organizations okay or organized religion their god doesn't come to, to stay in their hearts just imagine you like the great god who has his throne in heaven and the earth is his footstool decides the best place i can live is in the heart of a human being and yet even in that heart we are still pushing him out and saying no you don't belong to this heart this heart belongs to someone else okay so we have to understand those things all right so heaven now matthew uh, 69 jesus is training his guys his disciples on how to pray so because these guys have gotten to a point <laughs> and realized ah, 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 ah we don't know how to pray man you know see this guy how he's praying uh, maybe they were watching jesus and and his prayer life and and they could see that jesus was always um, fasting and praying and searching and and seeking god uh, because jesus had a habit of praying the entire night now The last time I prayed the entire night was a long time ago and I was very young and I didn't have anything else to do in life but pray a whole night. Okay? <laughs> Now, there are many people who can pray a whole night and and and, and I try my best. Uh, that doesn't mean I don't pray, but Jesus had this commitment. Maybe is because he knew his time was short. Many of us we really push prayers to the future. Uh, I'll pray in the evening, I'll pray tomorrow, I'll pray the following day. That following day comes and then you don't pray and and so uh you get old, you never prayed. So you start praying so much when you're old. I don't know whether that's the reason why older people pray more. Like old people, 70, 80 years, 90, they really pray. Maybe it's because they don't have anything else. Because this is the thing. We have a lot of things competing with our prayers or with our prayer time. Uh, you have kids, you have family, you have careers you have a job you have all these things competing with your prayer time and that is uh, uh, it's understandable but then it's not understandable that you keep pushing prayer uh, prayer time to another time and you are not pushing these other things to another time so make time to pray and so Jesus was a prayerful guy and these people who followed him his disciples 12 guys decide oh we actually don't know how to pray so let's ask the master to teach us how to pray 
And then, so Jesus comes up with this statement and says, this then is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. So I'm not about to talk about prayer, but just that one statement. The first thing that Jesus says is, you've got to acknowledge at least two things here. Number one is that there is a Father, our Father. And number two, there is a heaven. Okay? When you pray, so he says, when you pray, this is how you should pray. And so he gives them a template on how to pray because they also needed a template. Remember, these are like spiritual kids who do not have a lot of understanding about the things that Jesus is even talking about. It's like you and me, you know, and I have a very strong conviction that if Jesus Christ came to Kenya today, many people would not follow him. Even some people who are following Jesus right now would doubt Jesus if he came today. And this is the reason. Because you Kenyans are very critical about preachers. You guys are just the worst. I mean, like, when it comes to criticism, you Kenyans are gifted in criticism. You don't just criticize preachers. You criticize your leaders. You criticize the world. You criticize your state. And, and sometimes when I see things on X or Instagram or Facebook or TikTok about Kenyans criticizing their own nations, I want to pray for you that you become blessed financially to be able to travel out of Africa, out of Kenya to other nations in Africa, okay? And even beyond Africa, you need to, need to visit nations like Nicaragua, you know, different nations like Chad or, or uh, DRC. You know, just visit other countries and tell me what you are not grateful about by being Kenyan. But this is the thing. Uh, I asked someone a question. If Jesus was not, if Jesus was born today, let's say, for example, you didn't know about Jesus, you never heard about Jesus, and then suddenly uh, someone is born in around Kenya, maybe Gidurai somewhere. Uh, I don't know, Gidurai, you know, like, and, and someone is born and, and you are told the king, of, uh, the king has come. And so you're like, oh, okay, which king? Now, then Jesus grows up 33 years, 30 years later. There's this guy who's performing miracles everywhere. Going around, performing miracles, get the right market. He's performed miracles. He's gone to Kasarani area, performed great miracles. He's going up, down, you know, he's moving. Uh, uh, Kawangware, performing miracles. Would you follow Jesus? You see, the fact is, for example, you saw the recent... Uh, uh, visit of Benihin and and people criticized him even before he landed. They criticized him and criticized miracles and all that thing. And the funny thing is Benihin is a known guy like across the world, but still Kenyans will criticize him. And I believe that if Jesus Christ came in today's world, we will still criticize him. You know, this is a thing. Even if, even now, even now, we believers who believe in Jesus, I believe that many of us, if we had lived in the times of Jesus, we would not have followed Jesus if we had lived in his time. And this is what I think. If Jesus came back today and walked among us doing all these nice things, many of you Kenyans would not follow him because you are full of yourselves. And I'm sorry to say that, but you guys, you know, like we need to do better as Kenyans. Heaven is waiting for us. So Jesus is saying, he's teaching these guys how to pray. Now look at 1 Peter 3.22, very interesting, and he says, who has gone into heaven and is at God's right hand with angels, authorities, and powers in submission to him. So he's talking about Jesus who has gone where? Into heaven. It's not, a, a, heaven is not somewhere that is not existing. Heaven is existing. And so what Peter is saying is that Jesus Christ has gone into heaven after his death on the cross and resurrection. He's get to heaven. And right now, at that point, he was seated at God's right hand. You see, many people think that God stretched his hand and Jesus came and sat here. No, that's not what it means. It means that Jesus has been given 
a very special place at the right hand of God. In other words, if this is a throne of God, then Jesus is on this side on the right and, and he's ruling with angels, authorities and powers in submission to him. Let's understand that concept because we only think that heaven is con, con, uh, uh, comprised of God, the Holy Spirit, Jesus and angels. That's all we think. But look at this verse that says with angels, okay? That's all we know. But then the second thing that Peter says is authorities. And the second, the third thing he says, in, and powers in submission to him, to Jesus. So Jesus has been lifted above all these guys, uh, angels. He's been lifted above authorities who are in heaven and powers. These are different things, different people, different individuals, different beings. Okay. When you study Revelation and you realize that story, you get to that story of the four horsemen, you will realize it was not God himself who was calling out this man, but it was a voice from one of the cherubims. And they would declare and say, come. So you can, you can listen and watch the videos that we've done on Revelation. He says, come, and they would come. And they would come out, these this four uh, great uh, uh, four horsemen. Okay, so with angels, there are authorities in heaven and there are powers in heaven. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against powers and principalities and authorities in high places. Okay, some of these authorities are godly, some are not godly. But they are all under the submission of Jesus Christ. All right, so let's take a break. Let's continue with this conversation in the next coming days. Thank you and God bless you.